Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Schoonmaker. I am the Executive Director of West Michigan Salem Business Forum, and I am pleased to welcome you to our presentation today. For those that are not familiar with our organization, the Forum is a collaboration of business institutions dedicated to promoting sustainable business practices with a focus on climate leadership, social justice, circular economy, and community resilience. This is part of our, continue, of our continue, continue, continuing virtual series of online discussions surrounding sustain, sustainability and sustainable business. Uh, many, many, many of those in the context, context of how we're currently doing, doing business within the, uh, with, within the uh, coronavirus pandemic. We have uh, uh, Rose. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. Uh, we have a number of up, of of up, of up, upcom, up, upcom, uh, upcoming web, uh, webinars I'd like to hi hi highlight really quick, including next uh, next week's program, understanding liability incentives for food donation and waste diversion in Michigan. Uh, that's something that that's some, that's something that we've been working on as an organization for a number of years, and uh, have recently de 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 developed some res uh, some resources in partnership with the Harvard Law School Food uh, food, uh, food Law and Policy Clinic that we're going to be talking about and sharing. Uh, our speakers that include Ariel Odura of the Harvard Law. School Food Law and Policy Clinic, Corian Mansell of Massachusetts-based Center for Ecotechnology, uh, and myself of the uh, West Michigan Business Forum. The following week, we're, we're, we'll, we'll be we're talking about can Michigan's cannabis industry achieve equity and prosperity for an online uh, on, uh, on, uh, online forum on August 6th, at, also, also at noon, featuring Mar, uh, Marjo Bruner of Perpetual Harvest Sustainable Solutions, Tammy Vandenberg of the Meanwhile Pyramid Scheme, Decriminalized GR and the West Michigan Cannabis Guild, and Denavia Moget of Flourish, Black and Brown Cannabis Guild and Equity Pack. And on August 12th, uh, we'll, be doing, we'll, we'll be in partnership with our Lakeshore Sustainability Initiative for program Health Equity and Social Justice of the Waste Michigan Lake, Lakeshore with Angelita Valdez, Alexis Di of, of Latinos Working for the Future, Alexis Dye of Hackley Community Care, and Katie Moore of Public Health of Michigan County, and Julia Rupp of Health West. You will receive a link to a video of today's program with feedback survey and any no initial notes that, uh, that come out of today's program and email following this webinar. Uh, this series and all of our programs are primarily funded through membership donations. If you're not yet a member of our organization, I encourage you to consider becoming one. There's never been a, been a greater time to do so or a, a greater need. Uh, we do offer both individual and corporate memberships. And to that effect, I'd like to recognize uh, two individual members, Ryan Seeley and Dana, Dana Hill, Hill, uh, Hill Tunen. We'd also like to recognize a new corporate member, uh, Holland Based Collective Idea. You may also be interested in learning about our various working groups, including those with upcoming me coming meetings, such as our Solid Waste Task Force on July, 20 on July 29 next week, our L Lakeshore Leadership Committee, uh, which will meet next on July 6, as well as our Green, uh, Green, uh, Green, uh, Green Stormer Infrastructure group, uh, group and our Climate Leadership Working Group. Uh, please, email, uh, please email us to get, to get involved with, uh, with any of those initiatives. Now I'd like to introduce, uh, introduce our panelists for our program today, delving into indoor air pollution and sick, uh, sick buildings syndrome. Please welcome Carol Hessel, General Manager of Third Coast, uh, Third, uh, Third, Coast uh, Third Coast Test and Balance, an active forum member. And Alice Delia, the Laboratory Doctor, uh, Director for Prism Analytic Tank Technologies. Thank you for being with us today, Carol and Alice. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to no, be here. And Carol, I'm going to turn the screen over to you if you'd like to uh, like to share your presentation. All right. Everybody see that? Yes, we can. All right. So we're going to talk about sick building syndrome today. And I'm going to cover kind of what it is and some differences with um, 
building related illnesses. We're going to talk a little bit about COVID, how that fits in, and what some of the causes might be. And then Alice is going to talk about, okay, now we understand it. Now, what do we do about it? And she's going to dive into that a little bit more. So first, sick building syndrome. What exactly is it? Well, occupants in a building, if they're experiencing health and comfort effects that disappear after they're leaving the building, and that's a key um, denotion is it's when they're in the building and not when they, they leave or they go home for the day. And there's no specific illness or cause that can be identified. So it's just kind of this mystery. You go to work and you don't feel good. And then when you leave, you feel better. Now, ASHRAE, and for those who don't know what that is, it's the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. And they're the recognized expert nationally for um, heating and air conditioning cooling systems. And they have a statement that says, if 20% or more complain of symptoms for more than a couple weeks and observe relief when leaving, then it could be SBS or sick building syndrome. Um, and keep in mind that 20%, if you have an office that is maybe um, 10 people, it can only be a couple people. So we're not necessarily talking about um, half the office or a lot of people. And I wanted to note a difference in sick building syndrome versus what occurs in a high stress environment. So sometimes when employees or occupants are complaining of feeling sick within the workplace, um, someone may, may question, they themselves may question, well, maybe it's just, I have a real stressful job, I have a lot going on, there's just, it, it could be stress related, or I don't work in a good culture, and maybe it's related to that. And again, if we come back to the difference would be, if it's sick building syndrome or might be sick building syndrome, your symptoms are gonna go away when you leave. If it's a high stress environment, you're gonna feel that when you leave. When you leave work and go about your day, you're still gonna have those, those feelings of illness and feelings of not, um, just not being healthy. There's another kind of similar uh, syndrome, I guess, called building related illness. And I just wanted to mention this. So building-related illnesses are when occupants experience health issues that are clearly defined and have clearly identifiable causes. So what I mean by that is uh, just a couple of examples. So one is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And what that would be is, let's say you work in an environment that has a lot of dust or small particles and you specifically are contracting a lung illness because of that. Um, Legionnaire's disease is another example. And Legionnaire's disease is contained, it's a Legionella bacteria that's located in water. And that can be um, gotten into your, or absorbed into your body through in, inhaling air particles in your air conditioning system. So if you have a cooling tower, water cooled tower, or even things like drinking fountains can carry that particular bacteria. So that's what building related illnesses are. There's a very clear health issue and an identifiable cause. Build it with sick building syndrome though, uh, there's not really necessarily a cause that we can attribute it to. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, when we talk about health effects or symptoms or illnesses that you may experience, what are those? And there are five generally recognized categories of symptoms. The first one is mucous membrane irritation. So this would be something that affects the eyes, nose, and throat. Uh, could be things like stuffy nose, dry cough, increased thirst, dry eyes, um, any of those ear, ear, nose, and throat type um, symptoms that you may be having. And next is neuropsychiatric disturbances. So these are things like fatigue, headache, confusion, and dizziness. And of these, headache tends to be the more common one that people might be observing. And another area <clears throat> is skin disorders. Now skin disorders can be a little tricky to connect to sick building syndrome because there are a number of other conditions, skin conditions a person might have. So 
So they could have eczema or a rash from some other source. And so it can be a little harder to connect a skin disorder to sick building syndrome, but it can exist. So that's one of the categories. The next are asthma-like symptoms. So this would be tight chest difficulties in breathing. It could be someone who doesn't have asthma, and, but when they're in the building, they experience asthma-like symptoms. And they may actually think they are coming down with asthma and seek medical attention for that because they have the symptoms that mimic asthma. You also have a person that may already have asthma and can have those symptoms exacerbated. So they're generally managing their asthma well, but when they're in the building, not so much. And then the last area is unpleasant odors and taste sensations that can lead to nausea and headaches too. So think about, I, I know a number of people, myself included, that have been around people that are wearing heavy perfume. And I worked with someone once who wore heavy perfume and had uh, management had a couple of conversations with this person. Um, didn't change much, but when I was around that person, I didn't feel well. And then other odors too, there could be a, a person who's a smoker who walks in the building smelling of smoke. So that's another um, something that can occur and can lead to nausea and headaches and, and things like that. So when you think about the symptoms and these five categories and what a person might be experiencing or feeling, now let's talk about COVID-19 because that adds a different dynamic into all of this. So when you think about COVID-19 coming into the picture, um, one consideration is the virus itself being brought into the workplace. From the employee's personal environment. So we've talked about lung type issues and lung type symptoms. So coughing, headache, sore throat, difficulty breathing. Well, all of that are, or all of those are symptoms of, or can be symptoms of COVID-19. So now you have a different dynamic in place of the heightened awareness of COVID-19 and the prevalence of it um, in our workplaces and in our buildings, well, now that's another consideration to have if somebody is sick. And something else to think about along with this, so your employees are more exposed to sick building syndrome. And what I mean by that is, if you think about people that are coming back into the workplace, they may be what I'm going to call quarantined at the workplace. And what I mean by that is most employees in the workplace are not as mobile as they had been in the past. So maybe if you are someone who's a salesperson, for example, rather than making sales calls to people, you may be making phone calls rather than in-person visits. Meetings are done more virtually now through Zoom. And employees, I know, in the office I work in, employees are encouraged to remain more in their work area and not so much roam around the building or go to someone's office to meet with them, maybe try to do that via phone or a video conference of some sort. And it's interesting that the occupation that tends to experience sick building syndrome the most are clerical or administrative staff. When you think about it, your clerical staff and administrative staff most times tend to be more located in their area, maybe at their workstation, could be a smaller workstation, and they're not necessarily um, wandering around or going to different places in the building or leaving the workplace for different meetings or events or um, those type of things that a, that a management person might do or even a tradesperson or a salesperson or, or some of those other roles. So with employees being more sedentary in the workspace, they're gonna, if there are issues or things going on in the area that they work that cause sick building syndrome, now they're more exposed to that. So again, it's another dynamic to think about. 
And then lastly, the overuse of disinfectants. So one of the things, and we'll talk about this with sick building syndrome and, and some causes of that can be kind of this, this off gas or things that are in the air as a result of disinfectants. Well, we're using disinfectants more and that's a good thing, but unfortunately that can lead to overuse, can lead to chemical exposure. So something to be aware of. So let's talk about causes. So and I have these broken into internal and external and they're mostly internal, but I just wanna walk through these. So first, VOCs. So a VOC is a volatile organic compound. All right, so what's a volatile or volatile organic compound? So these are chemicals that evaporate or come or released from solids or liquids. So if you think about things like um, adhesives, carpeting, manufactured wood products, uh, upholstery, and things like that, they can give off these VOCs. And one example I use for this is I'm sure many people are familiar with new car smell. So you get a brand new car and you have new car smell, which is something, uh, a particular or a chemical coming off of the products or the items within that vehicle. So mechanical devices, so things like uh, copy machines, faxes, computers, they can give off emissions um, and heat also. Another source can be respirable particulate matter. And those, that's things that you can't, um, sometimes can see, sometimes not. So if you think about dust, um, soot, and oh, fumes, aerosols, and other matter that may be in the air, this tends to be a little more prevalent in certain industries, but there can be just kind of this stuff floating around there. Smoke is another one, smog. Combustion byproducts. So combustion byproducts, are produced when carbon-based fuels are burned. So gas appliances, fireplaces would be another. Another category would be synthetic fragrances, and we talked about this a little bit, but personal care products, so hairspray, perfume, um, even deodorant and, and things like that. And then lastly, biological sources. So think pollen, bacteria, viruses. Uh, things like fungus, mold, animal proteins. So an employee could have pets at home and come into the building with pet dander on them, pet fur on them that could be causing a problem. And maybe that's not something that people might be aware of or think of. Uh, external sources. So there's kind of three areas with these. Motor vehicle exhaust, and it ties in a little bit to poorly located air intake vents or other openings such as windows. So if you think about uh, outside air intake being located outside a building, uh, a little bit lower on the building wall and facing a parking lot and you have somebody with a vehicle that backs into their parking space, you could be bringing motor vehicle exhaust um, in through that opening. Um, and then of course, poorly located air intake vents and pesticide application. So I wanna talk just a little bit about energy efficiency and there is a role energy efficiency plays in this. So in the 1970s, and some of you may remember this, there was a huge rise in energy prices and a lot of buildings really focused on being more energy efficient. And one of the things that they did are a couple things. One is to make the building more airtight and to really seal up a building. Well, sealing a building is important to, to a point, but buildings also need to breathe. There was also an increase in mechanical ventilation. So if you think about your heating, cooling, air conditioning type systems, and those in a commercial setting, they work with a mixture of outside air and inside air. So back in the 70s, the outside air intake was reduced. So the system is not working as much to bring in outside air. And then also there were new synthetic materials being produced. So designers were starting to um, just have some new materials coming out. And these materials were giving off the OCs. So in our efforts to 
be energy conscious, we kind of created some problems that we maybe didn't realize that we did. So one comment on the, the synthetic materials, when it gets into the later 1970s, there was more of an effort to start to regulate that and um, really monitor and regulate to reduce that. So when we think about sick building syndrome and, and issues, they most likely or most often occur in buildings, number one, that are mechanically ventilated, so that's your, your systems that we talked about, have poor or ineffective layouts. And that um, kind of added into that, I'm including using materials, so carpet and fabrics that really aren't the best and have poor or no active maintenance arrangements. So these are just some common things that you might find in buildings with a SBS issue. So I wanna run through prevention in remodeling or renovation projects. Now, sometimes if you're doing a project, you may be bringing in a contractor to do that, but many times for a small project, it might just be done in house. And these are just things that to be aware of and to take note of. So first, ensuring that wiring has adequate grounding. And second, if you think about using stone, ceramic, or hardwood flooring instead of carpet. So carpet, while it has some advantages, it can be a challenge with uh, the, what it's off-gassing or the chemicals that are coming off of that carpet. Ensure proper waterproofing, so molds, can also cause issues in a building. So standing water, things that are wet. Avoid synthetic or treated upholstery fabrics if possible. So maybe look at other fabrics or fabrics that have a low VOC in your design efforts. Um, allow time for building material to off gas pollutants. And this one can be just a little bit tricky because each uh, chemical or each product has a different rate of off-gassing. So I don't know, and Alice may touch on this, I don't know if there's a good rule of thumb for that, but again, it gets back to that new car smell. So if you are remodeling in an area of the building and there are strong odors in there because of the products you've used, maybe give a little bit of time and increase the ventilation to kind of air that out first. Create sufficient green space. Green space is always helpful for reducing um, CO2. Dispose of building materials properly. Use lighting and colors that are pleasing to the senses. So sometimes a person who maybe has a headache, it could just simply be related to the wrong kind of lighting in the building or colors and patterns that really um, can bother a person. So just be sensitive to that when you're planning. Open office layout is best for ventilation. Uh, with co consideration for COVID-19. So with COVID-19, now we're trying to isolate people more and maybe put up plexiglass and separate people. So it's kind of a balancing um, that you need to do. And then just control debris, dust, and other particles as best you can. And then what about daily operations? What are some things you can do in your daily operations to reduce sick building syndrome? One is properly maintain the building. So I hear um, statistics out there and, and I see it in the work that we do that a lot of times buildings really do not have a very good uh, preventative maintenance program. They may have a program in place, but it may not always be followed. Um, and not to, you know, not to say somebody's not doing that, but there are people that are doing an excellent job with that, but actually, Adhering to preventative maintenance schedules are, is very important, as is fixing things and making repairs as needed. Ensure ventilation meets ASHRAE standards. So ASHRAE has a couple of standards out there. Um, I think one is 170 and the other one is uh, maybe 62.1. I'm kind of going off the top of my head, but um, it's something you can certainly look up for what their ventilation standards are. And replace um, wet carpet, wet ceiling tiles, stained ceiling tiles, again, to try to keep um, molds out of the building. Minimize the use of electronic items and unplug idling devices. So if you have a copy machine that goes into kind of a sleep mode, that's a good thing. 
store paint, solvents, pesticides, and adhesives in closed containers and well-ventilated areas. Um, again, another good thing. And then humidity level, normal recommendations for humidity is 40 to 60%, but with COVID, um, really the recommendations are more in the 50 to 60%. Uh, there is some information out there that a little bit higher humidity levels are good with, in dealing with the virus and um, keeping it away. So that's kind of it for my portion of the presentation. Um, thank you everyone. And now we're gonna get to hear from Alice, um, sharing her expertise and kind of what we do about all this. Alice, you're up. Thank you, Carol, that was excellent, as always. Interesting, uh, interesting. Uh, sick building syndrome and, and buildings in general are just a fascinating subject. They're very, um, they're kind of like a person, you know, there's a lot of different aspects to them. Um, they can kind of almost seem moody sometimes. Uh, you know, as you said, you know, maintenance and, and, and taking care of the building itself is, is, a, is a key part of, of keeping the building itself healthy. So, uh, so I'm gonna talk about um, some of the things that can contribute to it, um, putting a bit more uh, specific in terms of products and things like that, um, as well as you know, what we can do to actually limit or minimize sick building syndrome wherever possible. So uh, as Carol, um, said very uh, uh, cogently, um, just briefly, sick building syndrome versus building related illness. Um, people do often refer to them as the same thing. Uh, but sick building syndrome is, as Carol said, is mostly irritation symptoms that are in the building itself go away quickly once you leave. Building related illnesses tend to, con to be more uh, long-term contracted or chronic conditions um, that are then not limited to the building. So those actually could be more difficult to, to trace back in terms of if there is a, any kind of a source just because they are common in, in other areas. So uh, in general, um, anything that, that really is, is part or affecting the building can, can cause um, a building to have, to have difficulties. Um, design construction, system installation, um, I know that's a, a big one. I have can't count now the number of times I've dealt with something where something like spray foam insulation um, was misapplied and now you have a, a material that's not meant to be removed from, from a building that has to come out uh, because it didn't cure properly or it was too thick or wrong mixture or something like that. And that has caused a lot of problems. So certainly installing the various building materials is, is a key one. Um, Moisture, uh, ventilation systems in general, um, and the ventilation rates, as Carol said, ASHRAE does have uh, pretty good guidance on that. Uh, and keeping those ventilation rates is very important, not just for um, you know, health-related type things, but also for concentration. So you have inadequate ventilation, you'll also have um, buildup of carbon dioxide, uh, especially when you've got people gathered together, which not happening quite so much now. Um, but it's, there's been quite a few studies that show that um, as the carbon dioxide increases, people's ability to um, think critically uh, decreases pretty substantially. So, and then of course, activities, whatever you're doing in that building is always going to have an impact on it. So no matter how um, green you try to make the building, as soon as you bring people in and have them doing things, then that's another source that you definitely need to be cautious about. So, um, in general, indoor air quality, uh, there's lots of parts to it. So any one of them or several of them can, can certainly have a big effect. So temperature humidity, humidity to start with, there is a comfort zone um, that if you're too cold, too hot, too humid, too dry, people are just gonna be uncomfortable. So that's one of the first things they're gonna look at. Um, I mentioned carbon dioxide, there's carbon monoxide as well, radon, other kinds of gases. Um, Particles, these are essentially, in most cases, shedding. So the building itself can shed. You can get uh, 
uh, things coming out of the ventilation system, um, skin cell smoke, all that kind of, uh, of, of things. Uh, particles also include allergens, um, you know, pet dander, dust, all those kinds of things. Um, and mold spores are, are particles as well. Mold also has the chemical components um, that are the volatile organic compounds, as Carol described, and mycotoxins, which are another category. Um, so, and then the volatile organic compounds, that's kind of my thing. <laughs> so I will be talking a bit more about that uh, here as we go along. So, uh, as again, as Carol said, gas at room temperature is basically the, the definition. There are a number of official definitions, but it, honestly, it's really not worth trying to, to keep track of those. Um, and one of the reasons I want to focus on this is there are a lot of them, um, and they have a lot of very different properties. Um, most of the odors that you smell are going to be from VOCs. Uh, so that's one of the things people notice pretty quickly is, is odors. Uh, of course, not having an odor does not mean you don't have a VOC problem or an indoor air problem. It's, they're not necessarily going to be an indicator all the time. So uh, basically anything in a building uh, can, can, can cause problems. Um, you know, they have the building itself, so paint, flooring, um, you got underlayment, you got, you know, you've got a stain or a cover or a, a, a stain or a paint or a, a sealer or something like that on the floor. You've got carpet, um, carpet pad, all those kinds of things. Uh, mentioned spray foam insulation. Furniture can be a pretty big one as well. Uh, you've got wood in the furniture, you've got upholstery fab or fabric uh, in some cases as well as foam. The foam itself uh, can, can off-gas quite a bit. Uh, air fresheners, uh, this is a bit of a pet peeve <laughs> for me. Uh, people tend to use them a lot to make the, either to make the air smell better or to provide a certain kind of vibe um, for that space, but they are adding more chemicals that you could now, your body now has to, to, to process and take care of. Uh, cleaning supplies, uh, right now, as you know, as we said, talking about with COVID, um, there's people are using a lot of disinfectants, hand sanitizers, you know, all that kind of thing, which is absolutely necessary, but it is important to be aware that that is adding as well to, to what is, is going on in the air. Uh, then I said activities, you know, pets, mold, all those kinds of things. So for VOCs or chemical contaminants, um, there's, there's three factors that really affect the levels that you're going to see. Um, so the temperature is probably one of the bigger ones. So the higher the temperature, the more of those you're going to have in the air. Um, it's just, it's basically, it's an evaporation kind of thing. So the higher the temperature, the more you're essentially evaporating those uh, chemicals from the solids and the liquids into the air. Humidity is another one. Uh, typically, higher humidity, you're going to have higher VOCs as well. And of course, the other really big one is the ventilation rates. So the higher the ventilation, the lower the VOCs. So you kind of try to balance those out and, and uh, find a happy medium in there. Uh, in terms of measurement, um, there's a lot of measurements you can do, uh, but probably the easiest is the total VOCs. Um, kind of tell this chart, there's a lot of uh, different takes on what are good uh, levels of VOCs and what are um, going to cause health problems. Uh, but obviously, as you see, the higher the level you get, the, the more of those that you're going to find um, either basically an irritation kind of level and then other larger health things, you know, chronic conditions, um, eventually leading to, you know, certain other things like kidney disease or cancer or things like that. So off-gassing. Um, so this is a really key part uh, to really understand. So what we think of as solid materials isn't really solid. So uh, gases move throughout that material and they will typically try to, to shoot to or reach for an equilibrium. So if there's a lot in the material and not so much in the air that those gases in the material are going to slowly migrate to the surface get released from the surface and then swept away um, by the air currents or the ventilation system. And then <clears throat> as those are moved out of the way, then the, basically the process keeps going, it starts again. So it's a, it's a continuous kind of a thing where you're, you're having um, 
this movement through the material out into the air. The air moves obviously a lot faster than the material, so that is where you get uh, those emissions. Uh, and the newer materials are going to have much higher levels, so that is going to initially be uh, a much larger amount, which is typically when you're going to notice, you know, the headache or the odors or things like that. Uh, but the off-gassing process does typically take a long time, so it depends on, you know, what the amount was initially, the size of that particular object, uh, and as well as the composition of, of the chemicals that are in it. So um, paint is one that people ask questions about a lot. Um, you know, how long after I painted, you know, is the paint basically gone? Uh, and, and typically it's actually can be years. Uh, you only notice it for the first couple, three weeks maybe. Uh, and after that, the level's gone down enough that it's not noticeable, but it is still present. Uh, now, of course, if you're going to do a lot of ventilation and maybe up temperature a little bit so that, that you increase that rate of off-gassing, you'll increase the whole process uh, and, and shorten that time period, but it, it still often is going to take a long time. Uh, remember, you don't necessarily notice it um, because it's it not, doesn't have an odor or doesn't cause a problem, but does add to the load. Uh, I just want to give a brief talk about low and no VOC paints uh, as an example of um, understanding labeling, uh, because there is a, there's definitions for certain uh, labels and certain things don't actually have to have uh, any requirements. Um, organic, for example, organic materials, um, there, there isn't typically an, an official definition for what that is. So uh, low and no VOC paints, um, is it, it's a little bit of a tricky bit. So uh, there is a definition of VOC that has to do with outdoor air in terms of um, the reactivity of those particular compounds in the presence of sunlight, uh, which makes great sense for outdoor air, but it doesn't make as much sense for indoor air because we're not typically talking about a lot of sunshine. Um, so what they basically have is a list of VOCs that are called VOC exempt solvents or chemicals. Um, so these are, by the definition of gas at room temperature, it's a VOC, but they're not photochemically active, so therefore they are exempt. So that is what is in the low and no VOC paints, is these other VOCs. Um, so it's a bit tricky uh, in that sense because essentially you're replacing the VOCs with different VOCs. Uh, now the advantage of the low and no VOC paints is uh, the, the VOCs that are being um, put in place instead of these photochemically active, uh, typically the odor does not last as long. So after a couple days, now you're not going to notice uh, an odor or um, people will stop complaining or, uh, and, and all that. Um, however, there, there is a reason they use those uh, in initial set of VOCs. And so in some cases, we do find that people have to paint more frequently or repaint more frequently um, with the lower no VOC paint. Um, and the other thing to be uh, thoughtful about is um, the, the label for a low or no VOC paint uh, has to do with the base paint. So as soon as you start adding color or any of the additives or anything like that, you are now increasing the VOCs because those are not VOC limited in, in the sense that the, the base paint is. So you get a nice dark blue wall or something like that that was initially a no VOC paint it has VOCs in it, um, potentially quite a few. So that is also something to be thoughtful about is you know, what other things are you going to be adding to that base paint. Uh, in terms of what do we do? Um, so first thing to, to, to do is to really recognize what are the things that are going to contribute. So when we talked about, you know, furniture and flooring and as Carol said, uh, carpet, you know, has sometimes has a lot of uh, difficulties with it, uh, not to mention harder to clean. Um, so, but what is it that's there and what activities are going on and, and just general overall awareness of what's in the space that could be causing a problem or contributing to um, either sick building syndrome or um, just in general that the air quality that people have to deal with. So, I tend to think of it as the big three. Um, there's 
pretty much everything comes down to these one or more of these three things. So basically remove what you don't need. If you don't have, it doesn't have to be there, get rid of it. Um, we find this with uh, stored paint, maybe more in homes than in office buildings. But once you've opened a can of paint, it's really hard to get it properly sealed. So you get a bunch of those is sitting in some closet somewhere, um, just ready for, you know, the next thing. Um, and that potentially could have a big contribution for uh, the, uh, uh, the paint itself. So people will say, well, why, why is there still paint in the air? And they can say, well, it's because you've got 20 cans of paint um, in this closet over here. Uh, as well as extra stuff. You know, if, if you've got a lot of things that you're storing in general, um, I mean, is there the potential for those to be giving something off? You know, any of those kinds of things. Um, so after that comes contain. So if you can't remove it, can you in some way minimize the effect that it might have? Um, so if it's, for example, cleaning products, so you're only using them whatever time period or whatever schedule the, the cleaning uh, is occurring at, are they just sitting out on the shelf or on a cart or something like that? Can you find maybe a, like a plastic bin with a tight fitting lid to put them in? Uh, most of these products, they don't seal properly. Um, they're not meant to really. So you always have uh, what's termed fugitive emissions. Basically, it's just kind of coming out of the, of the container itself. I, I always think of those, uh, those wet wipes, you know, got the little flip top plastic lid on. Um, that is by no means uh, a solid seal. So that would be a perfect example of something that you could be putting it into something more um, that is going to contain it better. In something, in the case of something like that, even just, you know, a, like a zipper bag, a, like a Ziploc bag, would be better than nothing because it will still contain that to some extent. And then finally, dilute. So if you can't remove it, you can't contain it, or those measures are not sufficient, then you really are looking at diluting um, whatever's left. So ventilation would be probably the primary way to do that. Um, if that is either, again, insufficient or you just can't do it for whatever reasons, the system isn't built for it, um, it'll make it you know, too much of a, of a air changeover. Uh, then you can also look at some sort of an air cleaner or air purifier. So there are a lot of different kinds. Um, some of them are designed only for particles. Those usually have what's called a HEPA filter in them. Um, so if you see something that's got that, uh, that uh, acronym on it, that's what it's for, is to dilute or um, filter out particles. The higher the uh, particle or the HEPA filter number, the MERV rating on the HEPA filter, the more um, smaller sizes it will filter out. So it'll filter out more effectively the smaller type things. Um, then there are those that are dealing with the chemical contaminants. So those are, there's several different uh, kinds of those. Um, you can have something that's just gonna absorb them, something that's gonna convert them to something else, something that's gonna draw them into something that will then hold them. Uh, and then you get the biological part, um, which would be certainly viruses, bacteria, molds. Um, and that is often using something like a UV light or something like that uh, to basically inactivate that, uh, that virus, bacteria, or mold. So those are the basic things that, uh, that come up in terms of what do you do about this problem. Uh, as I said, it pretty much comes down to one or more of these three. Uh, but again, the first thing you have to do is look around and see what you might want to remove or contain or what areas are worse. Is there a reason why this area over here is worse than this one? Um, and don't forget, yes, the occupants, as you said, Carol, the uh, perfume or, or whatever it is that they, somebody loves to have, it's potentially going to be causing a problem. Uh, more and more places are going to something on the order of a fragrance-free environment. Uh, it's, I think, definitely helpful, especially for people who are more sensitive, who have asthma or some other respiratory condition. So um, just a quick summary. Lots of things are gonna be affecting the indoor environment. Um, you got the building sources, you got the occupant sources, the combination thereof. Uh, in general, occupant sources are easier to address or get rid of than building sources. Uh, so that is typically where people will start. There's contaminants everywhere. So you're not gonna get rid of them all. It's just a matter of understanding where they are and, and minimizing them to the extent possible. 
temperature, humidity, and ventilation. Uh, another of the big three, I guess you could you could call it. Uh, again, understanding the the uh, the interaction between those is is a critical factor. Uh, TVOC is a probably the only number you're going to really hear about uh, if somebody is talking about chemical contaminants. Uh, just a, a cautionary note, though, that you don't know anything about the composition uh, of what's in that TVOC. So you could have a very low value and yet you've got something in it that's going to be causing a big problem. So just something to keep aware of that if you do are looking at those kinds of things and you are do have a concern, you may need to get something a bit more specific. Um, uh, emission and absorption, that's basically the, the that's basically what off gassing is. You're emitting or you're absorbing. Um, and at some point you're going to be doing both at the same time. So um, labels, like I said, organic, chemical free, all natural, um, those are just labels. Um, chemical free is a favorite of mine because you can't actually have anything that's chemical free. Uh, so I always laugh when I, when I see that one. Uh, and then always remember to remove, contain, and dilute. So that's all I have for today. Um, and I have my email there and I'm sure uh, your, my rest of my contact information as well as Carol's will, will come out with the, the link to the presentation. Thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Alice, Carol. Do, uh, uh, we do have a bit of time for questions for uh, que uh, questions today. Uh, the first one I have is, uh, does the length of time for VOC off-gassing depend on the specific VOC chemical for harmful exposure or the material the VOC chemical is attached to? Uh, and that's coming from uh, Morna House Saxon. Yes, yes, it definitely does. Uh, Different chemicals will uh, have different properties. So if you've got something, you know, small and light, so it's more volatile, um, that will be released more quickly. If you get something that's heavier, uh, that will happen in a much slower time frame. Is there an action level for TVOC? Uh, not officially. Um, unofficially, 500 is is kind of a that you want to be under 500. That's what most green building uh, programs use. Some of them use 300. Uh, typically, in buildings, we're probably about twice or three times that. That's that's a fairly typical level to be at. I'm not sure if this one this one requires any further clarification. But is there a, a what is the longest time for VOC off gassing? potentially infinite. <laughs> um, it depends again on what it is, what a material, how much of it, all those kinds of things. Uh, I have seen uh, things that will take years to off gas to the level where they're basically undetectable. Uh, it could take a week, it could take you know, a month. Is it a safe assumption that if you're in an indoor environment that there's always some off gassing going on or is that? Uh... Yes, that is a safe assumption. And this one's from Chuck. How can the building HVAC ventilation system be used to lower, v uh, lower v VOCs? So uh, the ventilation system is going to sweep through um, and, and move the air basically from point A uh, to outside usually um, or through some sort of a purification uh, filter of some kind. Uh, Typically, you're bringing outdoor air in because outdoor air, at least in most parts of this country, uh, is, is cleaner uh, from that particular standpoint than indoor air. Um, so you're basically taking X amount and you're in Y amount of air, and now you've quadrupled the amount of air, but the X amount is still the same. So you're basically just spreading it out further. I'll just add um, something to that. That's I think um, Alice mentioned this too, given that there's VOCs uh, throughout the building and you're never gonna fully get rid of um, all of the, the off-gassing, 
and, and just so many other factors, it is important that the HVAC system be working uh, efficiently and working as it's intended to, so that it is properly ventilating the building and getting the air out, getting the air circulating. So that is something that's important. And then and again, as I mentioned with the COVID-19 being an airborne illness, that factors into that now too. So we do have another, uh, we have a question from Stephen. Can you talk about chemical sensitivities? Uh, most IAQ complaints aren't caused by elevated concentrations of uh, quote unquote toxic chemicals, but by individual hypersensitivities. Yeah, so yes, yeah, somebody can become sensitized to uh, one or more chemicals. Um, in most cases, it's after exposure, large exposure to something. Uh, and then afterward, their body is more sensitive to that, uh, whatever that, again, chemical or chemicals that might be present in the air. Uh, for people with chemical sensitivities, in a lot of cases, it, it may not be just one thing, it may be several. And so in general, they try to get the chemicals to the lowest level they possibly can, not focusing just on whatever it is that they happen to be sensitive to, but including everything else that they possibly can, can get. And I may need to I I I I may I may need to follow up, uh, Stephen, if you'd like to ask a follow up question there. Uh, when you're referring to chemical, you would mean you would mean man made chemicals and industrial or commercial products are brought into the building, not uh, not 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 chemicals as a colloquial term that could include uh, natural substances. Nope, that includes natural substances as well. Um, okay. Arsenic is a natural substance, <laughs> but you don't want to okay. eat it. Um, right. Yeah, wood, for example, any kind of wood product, whether it's engineered or not, is going to give off formaldehyde. It's just one of the things going to be given off by, by any biological material. I wanted to, to add, too, I think it's important that if an employee um, or occupant has a complaint or has an issue, that that's taken seriously and there's an investigation and a conversation. It could be a, a sensitivity that particular person has. Um, but I think that it's important to people to be heard and to know that someone is looking into it and, and someone is concerned. And so then some of those um, sensitivities can be identified that a, a particular person might have, but even so there's still some actions that you can take. Maybe it's a little different ventilation in that person's workspace or um, any number of things to, to try to make that situation better. And, and it could be somewhat um, self-caused too. I mean, that orange that got rolled into the back of the drawer or something like that, that is now moldy. So, uh, you know, an examination of the actual space itself is also very important because it may be something really simple like that, or it may be really complicated. It could be something with the ventilation system blowing right at that person that's different than the other areas for some reason. Are, uh, are common hy hypersensitivities known? Um, are, are they common? Yes and no. Um, I mean, a lot of it depends on the individual person. Uh, there's nothing that I'm aware of that's like a consistent, something that you can put a name on. Uh, but I, I mean, I, again, it depends. I mean, some people you could have, you know, two people standing right next to each other, one of them deathly ill, the other one perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. um, exposed to all the same things, you know, all of that. So it, it's very, very individual. Can you discuss the use of, of plants as, as uh, air quality filters? Uh, they're kind of a mixed bag, I think a little bit. Um, the, probably the most valuable thing plant, plants do is absorb carbon dioxide. Um, so again, if you've got a space, especially a closed space, you know, as you breathe, you're breathing out carbon dioxide. Plants breathe in carbon dioxide. So they're the natural way of, of, mon or of uh, minimizing or uh, um, removing carbon dioxide. In terms of other chemicals, there's been a lot of back and forth on that. And I'm not sure that in the long haul, having two plants in your workspace is gonna drastically reduce VOCs. Uh, I think they're nice and there's good for other reasons. I mean, people actually, they have been studies showing that people do work better with 
plants around them. Um, but in terms of chemical contaminants, I'm not sure that that was, is really going to be sufficient. No, it is commonly understood. It, it is uh, commonly believed. In fact, my wife gave me a book a few years ago called uh, uh, Gardening for Clean Air that, uh, that, that, uh, that house plants do have an air quality component to them. Is that, is that not, uh, not as significant as what is commonly believed then? Well, it's hard to say. And a lot of it depends on how many plants you have too. Um, you know, some of the studies that I've seen, it would have far more than you'd expect to see in a normal environment for that, for an appreciable effect to be observed. Mm -hmm. um, different plants have different uh, properties as well. So some of them may work really well at absorbing formaldehyde, um, but don't do very well at absorbing something else um, and vice versa. So a lot of it depends on the specific plants. I think too, just to, um, to add to that, when, when we talk about indoor air quality, that's a pretty broad topic and there are a lot of things that fit underneath that. So as, as Alice mentioned, um, higher CO2 level creates poor indoor air quality. So that's an indoor air quality element. So I think when you talk about plants, there is a, a specific use for that. But to say we can just put a lot of plants in our building and not have any issues, I think would, would not be the way you'd want to go. It's an or additional as primary means, you know, as a primary means to, to reducing issues. Yeah, in addition to that too, you are potentially introducing problems as well. So if you've got plants, you've got water. Um, assuming you've got dirt, there are, you know, air plants that don't actually need soil, but then you've overwatered your plant and now you've got mold growing on it um, or the water spilling somewhere. So now you've got a leak. Mm -hmm. um, so there are those issues as well. You, you have to maintain the plant just like you do anything else. I have a, we have a few things coming through, coming through the Q&A that are, are more comments that I just thought I wanted to share uh, in, in, in like a chat quality. Uh, so Stephen did mention that many occupants have pre-existing chemical sensitivities. Uh, Morna highlighted that uh, dust mites and mold can be perhaps more common than, uh, than the chemical sensitivities. Uh, and Stephen also highlighted that uh, uh, one of the reasons to implement a fragrance-free policy is not because fragrance compounds are, are toxic. Yeah, I think on the, the, um, the fragrance-free, it's more the sensitivity to, to someone who may be bothered and, and may feel sick because of um, the odor of someone's perfume or whatever. Well, we do have a few more questions coming in, but we are at one o'clock now. Uh, if, if you don't mind, Allison, Carol, if, if, if you'd like to stick around for a few minutes so we can uh, per, perhaps address some of the questions that are still, that are still coming in, I think, uh, I think our participants would appreciate that. Uh, but, 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 uh, but for those who uh, uh, would, would, uh, would, would, like, would like to sign off now and get on with your day, I appreciate you, uh, uh, I appreciate you all com com coming and particip uh, particip participating in our program. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Carol and Alice for the pre for, for for the presence for the president for speaking to us today about how indoor air quality can impact uh, the health and productivity of our employees and occupants. Uh, I will owe you a speaker gift. Uh, we're still trying to figure. It's a, try, a, try, uh, we've traditionally had live programs where we could give you a nice four pack of beer before you leave. And we're still trying to figure out whether or not we should do that via FedEx, but uh, you will have something coming your way at some point. Uh, for those who are signing off now, uh, please, please take a look at, uh, please, please take a look at some of, uh, at, uh, at some of our future programs and uh, please take the time to fill out our feedback form when you receive that later this afternoon, along with the, uh, uh, the link to, I think, to, link to today's presentations. Now, uh, Back to some back to some of our questions we have to have still in command. Uh, Chuck asks, "How do you address temperature comfort concerns from occupants when HVAC systems are operating within specified ASHRAE parameters, such as temperature, RH, and airflow? For example, large rooms with cubicles." So I think if I understand the question right, I think it's when you are different 
um, occupants are going to have different uh, comfort levels with temperature. So, you know, it's it's the the old I'm hot, you're cold scenario. And what we say is, if if in a let's say you're in a an area, a cubicle area, a larger room with cubicles, and and people have different uh, perceptions of the temperature being appropriate or not. To, to measure the temperature first of all and see are there are there significant differences? Um, is is there maybe a 10 degree temperature difference from one end of the building to the other or one end of that room to the other? And that would be something that we would in, encourage you to address. Um, we we look at things like different sections of the building, different offices that have a more significant variance. But if it's only, let's say your your temperature variance is only um, maybe a couple of degrees from one side of that room to the other, but people just simply are, some are hot, some are cold. That's probably not something you would address with the system. Um, it might be a conversation with the occupants to say, okay, this is the temperature, it's consistent across the room. Some are hot, some are cold. Let's have a conversation and figure out what temperature we're all going to agree is one that's acceptable. Any last questions or thoughts from uh, before before we wrap up today? Allison, Carol, anything further you'd like to share that came out of our last uh, last comments or questions? I'll just uh, kind of have a, a I guess a final thought is that I uh, in the work that we do we find that this whole subject of indoor air quality um, tends to to be something that I, I think there's some awareness of or, or people have heard the terminology, but there's not maybe quite as um, much focus on it and everything else everybody has going on in their lives, personal and professional. And we would just encourage people to just be cognizant of the issues that can arise. We didn't go into the, all the risk that goes along with um, issues. If an employee does get an illness at work, that can be a Miosha recordable event and can lead to other things too. So we didn't go down that whole road, but we would just encourage people to um, be aware, take note, listen to your employees, um, make sure your ventilation rates are appropriate, your, your system is balanced and doing what it's supposed to do, and, and you are um, just being cognizant when you're um, making changes in your building to um, flooring and, and things like that. Yeah, and I, I would uh, totally agree on that particular point. Um, I'd also note that with COVID, uh, our work practices have changed quite a bit. Um, so it's even more important to, to take a look or assess the indoor environment and see if things need to be changed because now you've got more people, fewer people, place their people are in different places doing different things you know all of those are going to impact how that building operates or how the employees are going to feel in that building so it's definitely a, a good time to even just do a walk around and just observe what's going on um, so that you can make those changes intelligently Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Alice and Carol, for taking the effort, 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 for taking for taking taking the time today. I learned I I learned I I learned I learned, I learned quite a bit, and I hope uh, I, I hope I hope, I hope all, all of our participants found this as found this valuable as well. And uh, please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Dan.